Hi everybody, uh, just to uh, echo what Nathan said, thank you all so much for coming along. Great to see uh, such a, a turnout today. A little bit about me, um, a freelance CTO, software engineer. Uh, I co-run a business called Package Buy uh, with Nathan for my sins. Uh, we're a software development agency um, working on all sorts of projects for clients. Um, AWS certified, I've got a, a few of them in the bag now, um, having a bit of a break before I move on to the next ones. Um, I'm one of the co-organizers of uh, PHP Northeast, so you'll often see me around here. And I'm the author of some now somewhat old software books that I don't think anybody buys anymore, Typo 3, I don't know if that still exists, Drupal, PHP 5, and some slightly more modern ones on Vagrant, but probably not very modern anymore. Uh, and I'm also the CTO of a EdTech software as a service startup called Tutexa, which makes online systems for tuition agencies and private tutors. So if any of you happen to want to dabble in private tuition, uh, have a chat with me afterwards. Um, so yeah, I mentioned consultant CTO as part of what I do, help to build software as a service products and teams. Um, I work with a lot of startups who don't have a technical founder, help to take ownership of um, businesses technology and as a sounding board for an existing team. Um, some businesses, they tend to think, oh, we want to do software as a service, we'll just employ a dev and they can crank out some code. But software as a service is so much more than that, even from a technical level, and I can help with that kind of thing. And I mentioned package buy as well, full stack software development. You give us your requirements and we package it up into a solution. And we also provide some sort of short term capacity support, full stack development if you've got a team that you need a bit of help with, um, some capacity in the short term. So the reason I wanted to do this talk is because everybody's talking about really fancy, complex, serverless, microservice architectures for their projects. You go to an AWS meetup, you go to a DevOps meetup, and you'll see some diagram of all sorts of fancy interconnected services all talking to each other, some really complex, fancy thing. But in reality, a lot of projects don't work that way, and a lot of people still don't know how to go about proper, sensible deployment for boring systems, small Laravel projects, APIs, things that don't merit this fantastic microservice approach. You've probably seen kind of diagrams like this if you've got any of these meetups, lots and lots of disparate Lambda functions all over the place, all doing sort of bespoke, unique things, taking care of their own um, bit of functionality, often talking to each other, talking to third party services, all interacting with one another. Works really well if you've got a big team because you can actually allocate individual teams to individual microservices. They can have responsibility for that. But if you're a small team, small business, it becomes quite, quite an overhead. There's a lot of complexity to managing that. There's a lot of complexity to developing it, to making sure it works and testing it locally. Um, so not every business is geared up towards something like that. I had a brief look on Twitter for what people were saying about you know, microservices. Um, one thing I, I spotted um, from yesterday, a recruiter emailing to ask somebody how their microservice journey was going. To their response was, travels are long and treacherous and one of my companions has caught the Kubernetes. We fear he is not long for this world. These are people that are doing this day in, day out and realize that there's, there's some pain to this. Um, so to expect developers that just work on single siloed applications to be able to go out into this serverless world is um, potentially a bit naive. <coughs> and as I said as well, some people are still struggling with regular deployments of regular projects. You've got a Laravel project, that's not really geared towards a, a serverless or microservice approach. You just want to be able to throw that at a server somewhere, throw it at Amazon, throw it at a platform as a service and have it run in the wild. And also, PHP isn't really well suited towards a microservices approach. It, it doesn't have a lot of the tooling that, that is needed for it. There are some tools out there that allow us to run PHP in a serverless way, to run it on the likes of uh, Lambda using uh, runtimes such as Bref. Um, I think Nathan's planning on doing a talk sometime in the new year about how you can do that. Um, but for most projects, that's not what PHP is geared up for and people don't, don't run it in a microservices way. They may run PHP as individual discrete services, and PHP works really well for that, but you still need a traditional way of deploying that, typically. Things like monolithic projects, projects with small teams, maybe you've built a proof of concept, and in reality, most Laravel projects, they're not gonna be something that you can deploy in a nice serverless way, discounting the likes of Laravel Vapor, which I'll briefly touch on towards the end. 
From what I see, deployments still seem to be a problem. In 2019, you've got people still using FTP, people still fudging things together with brittle shell scripts. I know from my own experience, up until quite recently, I was still doing a bit of a mash between shell scripts and Puppet, Puppet to manage my infrastructure, and some shell scripts to help where there was a bit of glue needed between components. Big companies and big teams have dedicated team members or even teams to manage their infrastructure and their deployments, but most small businesses don't have that luxury. Um, at the second PHP Northeast event that we ever did, this was the, um, the talk that was on that, that day. Um, it was my first talk for PHP Northeast. And I talked about automating deployment with shell scripts, PHP, and Linux. Um, that kind of thing was useful at the time, but the world has moved on, and, and people need to know what those, what those steps are. So how do you make the step from FTP uploading, collection of scripts, to something that's a bit more automated and a bit more professional? The easiest way is with platform as a service solutions. They tend to take responsibility for the underlying infrastructure. So they'll take care of the servers, the operating system, patching, all that kind of thing. And you just take your code, package it up in a certain way, and throw it at those providers. It'll deploy it, it'll manage the infrastructure, and it'll manage everything you need it to um, behind the scenes as well. Now, there's three kind of primary uh, approaches that I want to talk about in this talk. Um, the first is Doku and Heroku style systems. I think a couple of years ago we had a talk about Doku, so some of this might be familiar to you. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about Laravel Forge and also about AWS Elastic Beanstalk. They're all really good ways of being able to take your code, package it up, throw it at something, and have it deployed without you having to worry too much about the low-level things. You've still got to worry a bit about how you wire up um, those components, but you don't have to worry about the, the low-level infrastructure. So if we take a quick look at Doku, Doku is something you can install on a, a server, and it will take care of the underlying software requirements for your project. So instead of having to go and install a particular version of PHP for your project, you just install Doku, tell it you want to create a new project, throw your code at it, and it'll work out which version of PHP it needs and install that version of PHP. So if you've got a legacy project that's running on maybe PHP 5 something or 7.1, it's not ready for 7.2, you can have them running concurrently on the same server because Doku will manage some um, Docker containers behind the scenes and run your project in individual containers without you having to worry about that at all. We can create a project um, but from the command line by just saying docu apps create, the name of a project. Um, that will create the environment for our um, application to run. We'll need a database, which we can create with um, MySQL create. Um, MySQL is actually a plugin for docu, so we do have to install a plugin for that. And then once we've created that, that will create a container for us, and we can link that container to our application container. What that will do? It'll go and install uh, MySQL for us, it'll set up the container, it'll generate a password for us, it'll generate a username, and it'll also expose this uh, as an environment variable to our application. That's on the next slide. Yeah, so you can see here database URL is a, a DSN string that's exposed to our application. So we'll get the um, database, the username, the password, um, and the fact it's MySQL and the port number. All of that gets exposed to our application for us to uh, hook into so we don't have to worry about setting that configuration we just have to retrieve it um, when i was putting this talk together i had separate branches depending on where i was deploying and docu by default will only deploy from the master branch so you can tell it actually i want the deploy branch to be something else so if we push to the docu branch it knows to deploy our code the way we configure a docu project is just through a few simple configuration files in, in our project. Uh, the first one is a, a file called uh, .buildpacks. We just tell it that this is a, a PHP project um, and it's, it's based off Heroku, the way that it works, so we're just using Heroku build pack. And we need a proc file to tell it what processes to run. So we're gonna run a web process um, that's going to be Apache 2, and we point to our um, web server or the public folder for our application. We have to do a little bit of configuration for a database. So I showed you that DSN string that's exposed. That isn't standard environment variables that we'd expect for uh, Laravel. It's sort of a single environment variable with everything shoved in. So we need to grab that environment variable, and then where we've got our host, username, password, database, we need to uh, extract the component parts from uh, from that variable. 
So we do have to make a few little changes to get our uh, project doing what we want it to do. And any environment variables that we've got, we can set at a docu level using config set. And we just provide those environment variables. So we're keeping them outside of our code base and providing them straight to the, uh, the application. And the final thing that we need is to sort of run a, a post deploy script. We'll want to migrate. We want to make sure that our um, storage folders are all in place. Um, and we can do that with an app.json file. Um, we provide a, a list of scripts that we want to run post deploy. So there I'm saying I want to run artisan migrate and I want to create some storage folders. So a couple of folders and files and folders that we put into our project. And we've got something that we can now just push to, um, to Git and it will deploy. Um, if we want a background worker, um, we can tell Doku that we want an extra container called worker and that it's going to run QListen. Um, we'll have to tell it that there is a worker, which we can use with the Doku scale file and basically say we want one, one web container and one worker container. The only thing that's missing from a typical project is we don't actually get a queue with anything like Doku. Um, we would have to create a queue using something like Amazon SQS or something else and have the worker use that queue. And um, we don't get anything like Beanstalk D as part of the, uh, the docu package. But with that, a little bit of configuration with some files we can easily drop in. We then get an additional remote that we add to our project, which is our uh, docu server. When you install it, configure your SSH keys as you do with most projects. Um, and then we just push. So add the remote, push it and it will go and deploy. As part of the deployment, it'll look in your composer.json file, it'll find what PHP version you're using, and it will install that and ensure it's running the correct version of PHP. So if you've got a 7.1 project, it'll run, 7.2 project, it'll run, and they won't interfere because they're using uh, Docker behind the scenes. But as developers, we're not necessarily having to worry about Docker locally on our machines if we don't want to. So it requires a bit of configuration at a code and project level, not too much, but still a, a little bit more than we might like. We don't have um, a built-in queue, so we're gonna have to use some um, external queue service, but we don't have to worry about the infrastructure, literally a bare bones server, install docu, and we're good to go. Um, and we can configure the PHP environment with Composer. Forge is the next one that I wanna talk about. It's not really platform as a service, but it hides enough detail that you can treat it as platform as a service. This way you've got full control of the server, but Forge will manage everything uh, for you. I like to think of it a bit as shell scripts as a service because everything that Forge does is really just SSHing to your machine and running some shell scripts. It's just hiding all of that from, from what you see. Um, with Forge, once we've installed it on our server, we can create a new site from the Forge UI, tell it the web address we want, we tell it that it's a PHP or Laravel project and what the web directory is. It'll then go and provision the bits and pieces it needs on the server. Um, with it being a hosted web service, it can connect to our GitHub account. Um, there's a, an OAuth authorization in there and then we can add our repository. So it'll be able to get the code, it'll know when we've pushed and it'll be able to analyze the code as well. Um, so we can install the repository quite uh, quickly and then in terms of um, configuring it, we've even got a, it provides us with a shell script out of the box for what it would run on deploy. So even though I'm saying that more modern deployments are moving away from a lot of shell scripts, there's still often a little bit of glue for that final bit of deployment, that final little bit, bits and pieces it needs to do for um, getting something ready to run on a, a live environment. And it provides that without us needing to do anything. So that's not something I've configured. It was just there as a deploy script ready to use. And we can change that if we want to. It provides the ability to update our ENV file. So instead of committing an ENV file or having to go and set environment variables at a server level, we can actually just say, for this deployment, we want to manage what those environment variables are uh, via Forge, and we can manage those there. So we keep them out of our code. We're not having to go into the server directly to manage them. We're just managing it through, uh, through Forge. We can manage our worker as well, so it's got built-in support for, for workers. Um, when Forge installs, it'll install uh, queue drivers for us and other bits and pieces. And we can just go in here and say, yeah, I'd like this project to have a background worker. Here's the queue to use, here's the queue driver, and click to run it. Nothing much for us to do there. And there's three ways that we can deploy. We get a trigger URL, so we can just call that URL and it will tell it to redeploy automatically. 
Um, there's a button in Forge that we can click that will do a deploy. I think that just calls that trigger URL behind the scenes. Or we can deploy on push. Because it's connected to our GitHub account, it can actually receive a webhook when we push to our um, repository and deploy that automatically. So not a lot for us to do there from a deployment perspective. So yeah, trigger URL or deploy now or enable quick deploy. And if we enable quick deploy, it'll enable that webhook with, uh, with GitHub for us. So very little for us to do. We're not having to install anything on the server ourselves. We literally just sign up to Forge, give it an SSH key for our server, and it'll go and do everything that, um, that it needs to do. With this, we don't have to make any code or project changes. It can take a local Laravel project and run with it just as it is. The only thing we have to tell it about is our environment variables. All the server configuration is abstracted away from us. We don't have to worry about it. And the GitHub integration gives us this nice illusion of platform as a service, even though it's really just shell scripts as a service. And we can use the same queue as we use locally, like at Beanstalk D, so that's pretty cool. Um, Elastic Beanstalk for me has become a bit of a golden hammer. Most of my um, production deployments now are Elastic Beanstalk. Right faff on to get set up to do it properly. Um, but once you've got it up and running, you can plug it into your CI pipeline quite easily. AWS will take care of auto scaling. So if you need more servers, more um, worker servers, you need other bits and pieces, it'll manage that. And if you need to change your infrastructure in the future, you're already piggybacking on some, some really good components there that you can look to uh, tweak and customize as you go along. The only thing I don't really like with Elastic Beanstalk is it's built as a service for people that are new to AWS or don't know much about the underlying services. I think that really sells it short because while it's really quick and easy to go and set up an Elastic Beanstalk service, if you want to do it properly, you've still got to go and talk to 5, 10, 15 other Amazon services, get them all linked to each other, and do all the plumbing that you need to. So I think that's a bit of a, yeah, selling it short a little bit there. And what you get with an Elastic Beanstalk project, it's something that looks quite analogous to that serverless architecture. You get something where there's lots and lots of components all talking to each other, but these are all things managed by Amazon. We don't have to worry about them. So I'll just give you a quick run through of what this, this is. So this big outer box is a VPC, virtual network within Amazon. So we can kind of control the networking that goes on within there. If we don't want any external traffic to get into there, we can configure that. Uh, we've got a public network here. So this is anything that we want to be publicly exposed to the internet. And over on the other side is the, the private network. So that's where our application server would be, our worker server, uh, databases. They're all kind of stored in the, the private network. So somebody couldn't directly access it. And the way that traffic would come to it, we use Amazon Route 53 to deal with the DNS. It comes into our load balancer, and the load balancer will throw all the traffic to our servers over here. Um, and that's in a, an auto scaling group that Elastic Beanstalk could manage for us. So there, there's the three servers sat in there, but that's something that Amazon would manage for us and say, okay, your load's gone quite high, we'll actually add more service to the group. Um, your requests are going down, so we'll remove service from that group. Um, and at the bottom, we've got the worker tier. So the way it works with um, background queues is it's actually separate servers that will process those queues for you, and they sit in a separate auto scaling group as well. Um, up here, just, for, just to explain a little bit more about these components, uh, we've got a route out back to the internet. So our servers can't connect to them directly, but they still need to go and get patches from the internet. They need to be given code updates and that kind of thing. So they can connect via uh, an internet gateway and an at gateway uh, to the outside world. And then we've got some other Amazon services at the far end. So S3 for storing files, um, SQS for dealing with our queues, and SES for, for email. So that's all things that mostly is covered by Amazon. We still have to do a little bit of um, configuration to, to get things um, talking to each other. Um, I had originally planned to try and do a, a live setup of something like that, but I think it's, it's gonna be something that would take a bit too long given the, uh, the talk, so maybe one for another day. How we deploy to Elastic Beanstalk once we've got something set up, uh, we can either zip up our project, log into Amazon and just say, deploy this, this zip file, or we can use something like CodeChip. CodeChip is kind of continuous integration and deployment as a service. It'll connect to Git for us, it'll run our tests, it'll do any additional work, and then it'll package it up into a zip file and throw it at Amazon for us. So it's still just 
a zip file at the end of the day, but it'll manage it for us. Yeah, runs our tests, builds our project, deploys it, and notifies our team. Um, the way that we use it, again, we connect it to GitHub, like we do with most of these services. We tell it what repository we've got. And then we tell it what commands we want it to run as part of a test. So in this example, I'm saying it's PHP 7.3, um, we need a custom version of MySQL because the, the free version of CodeChip tends to use a, an old version of MySQL. So pulling down a new version of MySQL, install Composer, um, copy some config, and do our migrations. So it's just setting up a, a test environment for us. And then we get it to run our tests. So it won't deploy until it's finished running our tests. So just run PHP unit. And then we can say, if it passes, and the branch is our AWS branch, master branch, production branch, we can tell it that we want it to go and do a deploy. And to deploy, there's a few different things plugged in there. We've got Elastic Beanstalk as a first class citizen within CodeChip. Um, although my first step is actually a shell script. Um, so even though this talk was all about how you should move away from fudgy shell scripts, there's a couple of things that we want to do. Because this is running our tests, we've installed our developer dependencies, we've installed PHP unit, we've installed Faker, we've installed all sorts of crap that we need to run our tests from a development perspective. When we deploy that, we don't want those components installed on the server, we don't want the extra kind of classes there, we don't want the auto-loading to contain all that information. So we remove our vendor folder and we reinstall Composer um, without our developer uh, dependencies. And then once that's done, we can tell it to trigger our Elastic Beanstalk deployment. And we just plug in our credentials, access key, secret, region, and what the Elastic Beanstalk environment is. It'll go away, package that up, and send it to Amazon for us. So how do we take our project and package it up in a way that's compatible with um, Elastic Beanstalk? The first thing is um, there's a special folder we can create called EB extensions or .eb extensions where we can put some configuration files and scripts that get run as part of the deployment process when it rolls out to a server. So with Elastic Beanstalk, as soon as um, our code is deployed, it will take it and it will apply it to a web server somewhere that we haven't configured at all, it's sort of a blank web server. So there might be a few bits of config we want it to do. Um, so we can do that through some configuration files. Um, it's used for things like, if we wanted to, setting environment variables, but it's not good practice to have those in the code, to tell it we want to run our migrations, maybe we want to cache some routes, configure storage, set the worker path, that kind of thing. Um, and yeah, we can also configure the environment as well, so we can, oh, that's a separate slide. Um, yeah, so we tell it that we, where our document route is, what our memory limit is, and what our uh, worker path is, so we can provide it some configuration that it needs as part of the deployment. We can tell it to run some commands. So I've got a list of commands in a sequential order that it'll run. So it's going to run our migrations and it's going to cache my routes as part of the deployment. Um, and we can set some environment variables if we want, but that's something that's best kept outside of our code, of course. Now, if we've got an auto scaling group, we can configure Elastic Beanstalk to deploy either all at once, where it'll try and upgrade every one of those servers. If we've got, say, 10 running, it'll try and upgrade all 10 at once. Or we can tell it to do it one at a time. Now, if it runs it for all of them at once, one thing we have a bit of a problem with is we don't want our migrations to try and run on 10 different servers at the same time. There's a risk that if multiple migrations start running at the same time, and they're going to start to uh, conflict with each other and potentially do something we don't want. Um, so we can actually flag these as saying, when this command runs, it should only run on what Amazon elects as the leader within those that auto-scaling cluster. So Amazon will manage one particular instance and say that's the leader in that group. Um, and that's something that Amazon manages. We don't have to worry about it. Um, now, our web and worker environment, they're separate servers, but they tend to be deployed separately. So you deploy to your web environment, then to your worker environment. So that one's not so much a problem. It's the, um, the servers within a particular auto-scaling group. With a typical Elastic Beanstalk setup, the load balancer will manage our SSL for us. So we don't have to worry about registering SSL certs. We can provision one within Amazon. Um, if we've got the DNS managed in Amazon as well, it'll create DNS records to verify that we own that uh, domain. It'll create the SSL 
And if we're using it, it'll keep it renewed. So we don't have to worry about that at all. We don't have to worry about installing Let's Encrypt. We don't have to get any certificates. Amazon will just do it for us. But those certificates will terminate at the load balancer. We don't actually get the certificate to do something with. We can't install it on our server and do anything with it. Um, so when the traffic gets to our web application, <clears throat> Laravel will think it's unencrypted HTTP traffic. So we have to tell it that even though you've received what appears to be unencrypted traffic, whenever you're generating a route, whenever you're generating asset URLs, pretend that it is secure because in reality it is. From the user to Amazon, everything's encrypted. It's just within the internal network where things are served over HTTP. Um, so a quick fudge that I tend to plug into most projects is something where we just check the environment and if it's on an Amazon environment, so maybe it's a demo server, production, staging, UAT, whatever it is, we'll check to see if that's the case and force Laravel to be told that it's actually an HTTPS request so it knows to change its, its routing and its asset generation. <clears throat> now, the worker side of things with Amazon is, is something that to me was the biggest kind of paradigm shift as to how a project works. When you build your environment, it's web or worker. So the first environment you create is purely about serving web traffic. It can create jobs that go on a queue, but it does nothing to do with actually processing that queue. Instead, you have to deploy the application a second time in, in what's called a worker tier, so it knows to process jobs from a queue. And the way that works is Amazon will manage a, a daemon for us, which will receive messages from the queue, take them, and actually post them to our application. So instead of our Laravel app listening on the queue, which is what it typically does locally, instead Amazon will receive the message, and it will then fire a, a post request to a, a web endpoint on that worker server. Again, that worker server is private. People can't access it over the internet, so we can't have people throwing fake jobs at it. Um, but it means that we need to do a little bit of tinkering on to get our application to work and deploy. There's a really good package that kind of abstracts a lot of this away and, and deals with all the heavy lifting. Um, and I've just lifted some graphics from, from their package. So our typical standard Laravel application, got a web server, it's gonna push jobs into the queue, and you've got a worker that's gonna pull for those jobs run cron, schedule tasks, that kind of thing, and everything works quite nicely. In an Amazon environment, it's more like this. You've got your web application pushing jobs onto a queue. Amazon will then take those messages and then it will fire that request to a Laravel worker um, that it manages. Similarly with cron, if we've got any scheduled tasks, it'll take that and push it as a job into the queue. Um, and then our worker will receive that and know to do something with it. So. It's a little bit strange, uh, especially if it's not something you've done before and you're just locally sort of using a Beanstalk DQ or something like that. Um, and what's extra strange is Laravel supports Amazon's SQS queue driver out of the box, but it doesn't provide anything for actually consuming uh, messages this way. That's more designed for maybe you're using um, a supervisor DQ uh, worker and you still want to talk to an Amazon queue. So it's a bit strange that this isn't something they've got as a first class that isn't at the moment. A few other considerations that we need if you're going down the platform as a service route. Sessions, you can't really keep them on the, on the server that your web application's running on because the risk is you might have more than one server on, the, um, on your environment, especially if it's balanced by a load balancer. So you might wanna have a Redis cluster there. You might wanna put your sessions in the database. User uploads, same sort of thing. You can't expect them to just live on the server because that server might not have those, those assets on because they weren't uploaded to that server. So you need to start looking at things like S3 or third-party storage services and logs as well. If you've got servers that pop up as things scale and disappear as things scale down, your logs might disappear. So you want to make sure your application logs are streamed either to Amazon's own logging service or something like uh, PaperTrail. Um, yeah, I don't really think there's enough time for me to go through building an environment. Um, it's quite a a long task so I'll, I'll not um, bore you with um, with all the ins and outs of Amazon but it's it, it's quite an interesting thing to do and there's quite a, a few interesting caveats to it um, but just to summarize for the last of Beanstalk it does require some project and code changes a bit like using Doku and Heroku queue workers are the biggest difference in that the, the way it works is structurally different it's a completely different paradigm to regular projects but it is platform as a service it manages the underlying operating system. 
really you should never ever connect to the web servers running in Elastic Beanstalk. I can't think of a time when, when I've ever SSH'd into one of those uh, machines because they're ephemeral, they're things that they pop up, they run for a while, they disappear, and when they do disappear, Amazon will throw a new one up for you. Um, and it leverages Amazon's scalable infrastructure, so you're not worrying about how it should create new servers, you're not worrying about that server's being decommissioned and we need to create a new one. If one gets deleted or decommissioned, a new one will pop up in its place and auto-deploy, so it's really nice from that perspective. Um, and as with all of these approaches, you can connect it to Git so it'll auto-deploy or you just throw your code at it without you having to worry about what happens behind the scenes. The final thing I want to touch upon is uh, Laravel Vapor. It's not something I've used myself yet, um, so I'm not really going to walk through how to use it in this, this talk, um, but a lot of people, a lot of you have probably heard about it and seen what it's, what it's all about. It's basically a way of taking a Laravel application, packaging it up, throwing it onto a serverless function, but having that single um, Amazon serverless function respond to all of your web requests, as opposed to just being one specific thing. So yeah, packages your application as a single serverless function. Uh, that way you can leverage the fact that it's cheap, it's supposed to be quick, um, and it should be fairly easy to deploy in the same way that you um, just zip something up and throw it at Amazon um, without having to worry about creating the infrastructure. A couple of things I would caveat it with. Um, until very recently, serverless functions that needed to talk to other resources like a, a private database or anything that you had as a private resource in your Amazon account were really slow, at least that first time a function booted up. This was because of Amazon's network connection. It would take sort of 30 to 60 seconds for it to allocate a, an elastic network interface. That's something that literally a couple of weeks after Vapor was announced or um, went live, uh, Amazon had rolled out an update for. So this might've been something that was in development knowing that this solution was coming. As a concept, serverless is designed for small discrete bits of code. It isn't designed for, let's take a big thing, package it up and shove it onto serverless. but if it works, then that's a good thing. But there are some limits because it's designed for small projects. Um, as a result, Vapor have had to quickly change to split the vendor folder out. So you've got a deployment of your vendor folder and a deployment of your code. Um, otherwise, there was a risk you were gonna hit a file size limit that, um, that Amazon have for serverless functions. So one thing that I see is a bit of a risk there is because it's a bit of a fudge, there might be limits that get introduced or that um, happen with certain projects that aren't well suited to this. Um, the other thing is they're really abstracting all of the, the setup. You're getting a custom runtime that Vapor provide. They're managing all of the, the setup and the deployment. How easily could you replicate it if they stop doing that? So something to consider. Um, and I think we should have a full talk either about Vapor or about Bref, which is the serverless runtime environment for your own PHP project. It's not the one that Vapor uses, but it's a similar one. Um, I think Nathan's thinking of doing a, a talk in the new year on that, so fingers crossed. Um, and I just wanted to leave on the Vapor front, there was a tweet about this uh, a week or so ago, getting reports of deployment problems on Vapor because they were getting uh, errors from the AWS API. If you're relying on something that's abstracting something this heavily and then not too sure about how the underlying things work and where an error comes from, it's maybe not something you want to use for your production deployments just yet, but it's certainly got a lot of promise and it's one I'm looking forward to using um, when I can justify it and when it makes sense. So yeah, there's lots of ways you can quickly deploy your monolithic application. A little bit of fiddling around, a few config files you need, but once you've done it once, it's a case of copying them for, for your next project and you don't have to worry about the server configuration, just a little bit of config for your overall environment and the rest is taken care of. Not going to take any questions. It's time to go to the pub. Um, and just a final thing, as Laura mentioned, um, so our new uh, recruitment sponsor from next month is uh, Ronald James. They're taking over the sponsorship. Um, so we'll be, yeah, looking forward to working with them in the future as well. Um, and that's it. So thank you very much.